let, let, let's transition to secondary to bulking. Um, uh, Brian, tell us a little bit about the, the, the passion of the Germans and the desktop sort of idea of what just what they're thinking and what the ideas of a secondary operation. Sure. So when we're talking about, um, that's a great question, Brad. When we're talking about secondary site reduction, we're talking about in those places with patients with platinum sensitive recurrent disease. So that means that the disease came back um, six months or greater from the time that they finished their, pro their, their first line chemotherapy. And, and the, the rationale really is um, who are good candidates? Are there, uh, or is everyone a good candidate for this type of surgery? You know, I think that you referred to the, the, the German study and there's a study that was done here in the U.S. as well. Um, we need to really um, identify a group of patients that may benefit from secondary side of reduction and then better study those group of patients. The results of the study so far show that in all comers, it's probably not, it's probably not going to portend a, a better prognosis. But I think there's, in, in my practice, for example, I have a patient who's eight years out from her primary surgery, a very unusual case, but eight years out from her primary surgery and chemotherapy with an isolated recurrence, which was biopsy-proven um, ovarian cancer, I'm going to take it out. Yeah, so that's what the Germans would suggest, that if you had an R0 in the beginning, okay, if you have lacocytes and you have oligometastases, that you have a success about three quarters to have a complete resection, which is the goal. But GOG213 didn't show that. Correct. And so tell us, tell us what GOG213 is and if that's affected your practice. GOG213 is similar but distinct from desktop OBAR, desktop OBAR which is the German study. Um, similar in that it took patients who were uh, considered eligible for platinum and for whom the treating physician felt like surgery was reasonable. That was sort of the, the criteria and randomized them. There were two randomizations, one for chemotherapy with or without bevacizumab, but the one we're talking about is randomizing them to secondary surgery or, um, or just straight on to chemo. That's different than the desktop OVAR that had very specific criteria, as you just mentioned, performance status, no ascites, uh, complete resection at primary surgery. So different populations. But the R0 rates were the same in both studies. So they got to the same place. They got no to the same, what. a little bit lower in 213, but really statistically similar. When you look, so 213 has been able to show not only progression-free, but overall survival. Desktop over has only presented progression-free survival. Uh, and they both show the identical same thing, that uh, in patients for whom you got to no gross residual, the progression-free survival was greater. If you left anything or didn't do surgery, they did about the same. And so there's no point in going if you don't get it all out. The curves almost overlie one another between the two studies. And that makes sense because if you take the tumor out, of course, your progression-free survival better be longer or something's really wrong. <laughs> but then, um, and so that's where desktop over starts and we await the overall survival. 213 has OS. And quite surprisingly, OS was poorer. A for year the, less. A year less. So if you do a second operation, you shorten your patient's life by a year. A year. So I don't think that's surprising, quite frankly, because R0 patients do better, you said it, but they don't do better because you have a bigger knife. They do better because what Elena said is they have better biology. Right. So right. has that changed your, 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 your thoughts? I always say it takes two studies to convince anyone of anything. 213 is only one study, so I'll give you a pass if you're waiting for, for the desktop three, but what do you think? It hurts me as a surgeon. Why? I don't know what to do anymore It hurts your myself. patients when you do it. <laughs> Valid point. Valid point. Always the same. Um, but yes, I mean, the data, the data of, co of course, speaks, but I think once we see the overall survival for desktop, it'll be clearer. But I, again, I think everything is personalized. You know, like Brian's patient, I would do the same. You know, isolated tumor. You know, I believe in stem cells. I believe that there is some sort of clones or subset of tumors that cannot be destroyed by chemotherapy that need to be surgically destroyed. The, the other thing that has changed the frequency of secondary debulking is how we closely monitor patients. Right. So e even, even though uh, uh, there was a suggestion by Rustin that maybe CA125 monitoring was not recommended, we still all do it. And then when the CA125 goes up, we find very, very small volume disease, if any. So we don't just watch the patient until they have this that might need to be cut out. So that's the, se the, the other reason while secondary debulking is almost never practiced. And while in the first line setting, um, I know it was talked about earlier, maybe a minimally invasive approach after um, 
neoadjuvant. I, I'm not in favor of that. In the first line setting, I believe a person needs a vertical midline incision to make sure there's no palpable disease. However, though, in the platinum sensitive setting, if there is an isolated recurrence, we can take advantage of the surgical technology we have now using either robotic or minimally invasive. Or the radiation oncology technology and do radiosurgery.